Welcome to Prosperity Trade, uh, where we do trading, investment, we take stocks, we break them down, we talk about stocks that we like, that we don't like, we talk about day trading, swing trading, uh, trading options, hedging positions, uh, breakthrough technology. Uh, today we're going to be discussing exact, uh, it's one of those stocks that we believe have a lot of upside, uh, they have the possibility of uh, being at the forefront in that disruptive technology, which is where you see the most growth. Uh, if you look at the way the stock market is, you have your major companies that year after year, they're always going to have growth like the Coca-Colas, the Microsofts, Apples, but it's a certain percentage, just like the SPY. If we look here, um, the SPY, how much has grown as opposed to the Russell and the NASDAQ, which has those new has those those techno the new technology new companies that are growing, uh, and that's kind of what we look for. We look for those type of stocks, but we do diversify and of course invest in the you know the apples and the Microsofts. Uh, today, to help us kind of go over this company, uh, their new technology, their involvement in genomics and cancer and precision oncology, is Dr. Ismail. Dr. Ismail, Ismail is an oncologist himself board certified doctor. And doc, if you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself and talk about your background. Hi, my name is uh, Ismail Shokat. Um, I'm a medical oncologist and have been practicing over the past decade. Um, and um, my patients include patients that uh, have a um, broad range of cancers. Um, and I'm also a hematologist as well. And uh, we deal a lot with genomics uh, on a daily basis. Great. Well, thank you for that. So today we're going to be discussing uh, exact, and we like to we like to do our due diligence on stocks that we think have potential of being breakthrough technology. So we have the stocks, of course, that have the moat, have their own moat, stock moat uh, per se, like Apple, Microsoft, Walmart. Uh, these stocks are going to be around for a long time because they have a stronghold in the market, and it's good to invest in them. You know, especially if the markets are down like they are now, it's a good time to get in. And they'll give you strong growth, just like the SPY uh, will give you 10% growth every year. Uh, so we invest in those, but we like to diversify and get into stocks that have potential of growing a lot more than the average uh, uh, stock. So to find those type of stocks, we have to kind of see stocks that are starting to transition, uh, buying other companies, investing in themselves, and kind of going through another phase where they're starting to grow. And I think Exact Science Corporation uh, might be one of those stocks. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and do our due diligence here. Uh, before we just start, just a quick disclaimer for ourselves. I'm not a financial advisor. This is just purely for education. Anything we discuss, please do your own research. And anything we discuss with the doc or anything medical is not medical advice. This is just for educational purposes. So please do your own research. So Exact Science, uh, they started off as a molecular diagnostic company. Uh, their first product was Cologuard, uh, very well known in the medical field. Uh, is that right, Doc? Cologuard. Correct. Correct. It's a it's a device that uses CT DNA uh, from stool to check to see um, the the chances of developing um, colorectal carcinoma. Okay. And we'll talk about the pros and the cons. There's pros. Um, I actually um, I actually read uh, another investor, and he talked about it like Cologuard was going to take over colonoscopy. But then when I did my own due diligence, you know, I, I the GI docs and the the, the surgeons that work, uh, they still consider colonoscopy as kind of like the golden standard. Is that right, Doc? Correct. That is that remains the gold standard due to many reasons. Um, number one is that uh, Cologuard, although it is very specific it is not 100%. Um, there's a, many patients that who fall through the cracks, um, and therefore, uh, like you stated earlier, um, the colonoscopy is the gold standard, and that's what we use, and it's, it's better at detecting smaller lesions as well. Absolutely. That, that color guard can't pick up. Absolutely, and we'll discuss that in further. So they started off uh, in 1995, founded by Anthony Schubert, who holds nearly 30 patents, and six years after founding his company, he launched the IPO in 2001. Uh, for years, they traded really cheaply, you know, a couple dollars, five dollars. Uh, and recently, they went as high as 160, 170 per share. 
and just dropped to 130 with the with the uh, stock correction. So they've tested over 4 million people this year alone. Um, one of the things I like about this company is the management team, you know, so they, they do Color Guard, but they've expanded and they've also made a quarter, quarter billion dollars testing for COVID. So, you know, they kind of adapted to the time and, you know, not all companies have done well during COVID. It's also a great, considered a great work environment where they have over 5,000 employees and they were awarded um, uh, by Fortune to be one of the best workplaces. So here we look at in 2017, uh, their compound annual growth rate uh, shows that it's 75% from 2017. So 2017, they made over a quarter billion, then 454, 876, up to 1.49 billion. Um, and with that, they're still not profitable, you know, even though they've uh, made 1.49 billion. And, you know, I've, I've gone through their financial statements uh, they're, they're, they're a strong company financially. You know, if you would have looked at Amazon a couple decades ago and, and you look at some of their PE ratios and some of their, their numbers, you would think that they're not a profitable company or they're, they, they're not managing their money well. But when you look deeper, they're investing in themselves. Just like Amazon always uh, uh, invest in themselves, uh, this company here also invested in themselves. They recently had a purchase of Thrive, a company called Thrive, for $2.1 billion. So you have to take that into consideration when looking at their numbers. So their fields of study, uh, they work with primary care, GI, women's health, oncology, urology, health system, and their goal really is early detection. Uh, they lead three of the largest impact opportunities with diagnostics, which has an $18 billion potential, and that's in their colorectal cancer screening. Also with $25 billion potential with multi-cancer screening and $15 uh, billion in minimal residual disease and reoccurrence monitoring. monitoring. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, minimal residual disease is it's like when there's a small number of uh, leukemic cells, right? It's it's basically uh, it checks how much um, residual like the name says how much residual disease is left over after treatment. So the the more or the less cells that you see doing that follow up is patients have a better outcome. So that that's the leukemic cells, right? Or correct. Okay. Well, I mean it, they use it for leukemia, but it's also used for other diseases such as multiple myeloma as well, which is another type of cancer of the blood. And I, I read somewhere that usually that's kind of like one of the mo most major causes for relapse. Correct. Well, it's not the cause of relapse, it's an indicator of relapse. So um, in, in patients that have a higher minimal residual disease, their chance of relapse is much higher than patients whose minimal residual disease is much lower. So so screening for that is extremely important, right? I would I would assume. Correct. Correct. So and it's it's not unfortunately it's not it's not widely available at this time. But it's it's it, it's definitely available in the bigger centers, um, big, bigger academic centers. Excellent. So, so for them, it's important. They want to screen patients before being symptomatic, having any symptoms. Correct. So, so that Correct. would be especially for like the uh, colonoscopy, right? That's where colonoscopies come in and colobards come in. Correct. Um, Correct. So, the, so there, there's two types of cancer that are really um, uh, prevent. We, what we say preventable. Number one is um, mam um, breast cancers by mammograms, and colon cancers by a screening uh, via colonoscopies. I read somewhere that if you catch it early, there's 90% success rate of curing it. That is, that is correct. So depending on the state. On the state, okay. Uh, yeah. So that's that's kind of their plan. They want to screen before the patient's symptomatic. They want to have the prognosis and the therapy selection, uh, minimal residual disease, monitoring that, reoccurrence monitoring, and therapy selection. So here's some facts uh, about colorectal cancer according to the CDC. Uh, they stated that there was over 140,000 cases of colon and rectum cancer and 52, over 52,000 people died. And for every 100,000, you have 37 new colon and rectum cancer cases that were reported and 14 of those people uh, died in, uh, of this cancer, uh, which is pretty significant, I would, I would think, right? That's, that's a pretty high number. Correct. That's very good. Yeah. It's, it's um, one of the leading causes of death um, that is cancer related. In the United States. Wow. So, and it's preventable. Yeah. It's preventable. Right? Correct. So, is that's it, the biggest thing. Is, yeah. is it is it just a lot of people don't 
are scared of the 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 colonoscopy. Uh, uh, colonoscopy is correct. Colonoscopy. So I mean, that's that's what we encounter in our practice. Is patients are more scared of the procedure itself rather than this this the effects that might happen if they don't do the colonoscopy. Like for example, the presence of metastatic disease, meaning cancer spreading to different organs, which means that they their disease is incurable, but it is treatable. Absolutely. So. And here we, we talked about that. It's a 90% success rate with early detection. And it's an $18 billion uh, um, market. And they put this like on their um, on their website, you know, for investors. And it's 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 a little misleading. I mean, it's an $18 billion market, but I, they have a small chance of, of they, don't, they don't have a large chance of capturing all of that, obviously. I, I think they would play a small role. Um, and I don't think doctors would recommend Cologuard over a colonoscopy. Uh, not, not at this time. Yeah. It's for patients who are unable to do colonoscopies for whatever reason. Um, Cologuard will be the second line. What about like um, like a healthy male? Because I know, for example, like if someone's prone to cancer, automatically it's colonoscopy, right? Um, Correct. So I mean, so family history. If you ever had a family history, um, then Cologuard would not be the option to do. I mean, the first thing would be a colonoscopy. And would they, would they, would some doctors maybe look at it as, hey, this is better than nothing for like uh, a healthy male, let's say, that is not willing to do a colonoscopy, but maybe saying, would they, would they maybe then recommend this as a better alternative for nothing? Correct. It is, it is definitely, definitely better than not doing anything at all. Um, so the, the sensitivity rate is pretty high. Um, but again, the specificity is not, is around 87%, like you have on the screen. Uh, which means that there's a lot of cases that do fall through the cracks. Absolutely. And so yeah. so here, this is uh, um, uh, what they published. Um, and it's also backed up by the New England Journal of Medicine. I have the link here. Um, they have a 94% for early stage cancer sensitivity. Uh, it's non-invasive. They actually send it to your house. So it's, it's COVID proof. You know, it's uh, no sedation, no preparation, no time off of work. And they also have 24-7 customer uh, support. So if you get the box and for some reason you want to do it at 2 in the morning, you can still have uh, support. Um, this, this was developed with the Mayo Clinic. So here, uh, I think this is some of the things we were discussing, just um, Cologuard versus colonoscopy. Uh, this is not a pros and cons of just kind of discussing each one. Uh, and the doc, you can just kind of discuss the difference between Cologuard, uh, uh, Cologuard and colonoscopy. Yeah, like you said, it's basically the Cologuard is a test that's done stool-based, checking the DNA for any um, cancer cells um, or predilection for cancers. Um, as 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 compared to colonoscopy, which is a is the procedure itself, uh, which utilizes um, a direct visualization of the of the colon. Um, and but unfortunately, there are some issues that are, occur with colonoscopy, which is like you mentioned earlier, which is. Um, prep th that most patients do not um, really um, enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but it's but it's it's something that it, it is the gold standard. Um, it you know, like you said, it's um, it does allow for detection of smaller polyps and smaller tumors, and also allows for resection at, at that same time as well. Yeah, and one of the things that worried me the most about Cologuard, and these are these are list these are things that I listed here. Uh, yeah. And I based this off of, I went on multiple credible sites of, uh, uh, of uh, kind of like oncology teams, GI oncology teams, digestive disease centers, right. and I have them all listed there. And really this was uh, the most consistent concerns that I've seen them know about using Cologuard over colonoscopy. Right. And one of the things right. was that it fails to detect the polyps, the precancerous polyps, 42% of the time. So if you can kind of discuss what exactly is a polyp and why is that important to kind of detect early on? So polyps are pretty much, uh, polyps could be growths that occur in the colon. They could be either benign, which is non-cancerous, or they could be malignant, which is cancerous. So this is where usually the cancer begins. So when we have a colonoscopy and they take out that polyp, that's kind of where the cancer begins. And usually when we take that out, and if you have a good amount um, of tissue around it. Um, you still need to see a surgeon. You still need to have possibly have surgery if there's cancer, if there's cancer involved in that polyp. So it still, um, it still renders you uh, in early stage of disease most of the time.
So if, if they find one of these polyps and they find that it's malignant, um, would they go back in for another colonoscopy or are you cured from that cancer? No. So unfortunately, if they do find a polyp that is cancerous, then that time they're referred to a surgeon. Um, and the surgeon usually does uh, removes a portion of the colon, uh, depending on which portion the polyp was found. Um, and then after that, then the pathology is looked at and then Oncologists such as myself make a decision whether chemotherapy is um, part of the process or not, part of the treatment or not. So do they remove that part of the colon because of fear that the cancer might come back in that area? Correct. Okay. For recurrence and, and progression of disease in that area. So, so another issue with Cologuard is they're false positives and they actually have like a list of foods that can possibly uh, trigger some of these false positives. Uh, do, you, do you do you know why some of these some foods trigger false positives with this with this test? Um, that I don't have knowledge of. Okay, uh, and I actually uh, I actually sent them an email. I did email them and asked them why do some of these foods trigger that? Um, I haven't heard right. back from Exact yet, uh, but it's it's the weekend. Um, right. But if I do find out, I'll I'll definitely get back. So the colonoscopy detects ninety five percent of all colorectal cancer as opposed to uh, Cologuard, uh, which is 94% for the cancer and 87% uh, for, um, what did you mention before? Um, um, say that again, I'm sorry. The 87% the, the uh, that the- Right, for, uh, that, that's a specificity, okay. meaning how, um, what are the chances of it truly being um, related to the cancer? Okay, so then Cologuard has about 13, they say, thir I saw once one reading of 13%, I've seen other numbers of false positives. And one problem with that, right. if you get a false positive and you have to do a follow-up colonoscopy, sometimes it may not be covered by all insurances because they only right. allow one screening. Is that is that something you come across? Correct. That, that is sometimes that, that is a possibility. And, and insurances varies from insurance to insurance, but um, I would not be surprised if some insurances did not allow that to happen. Uh, and colonoscopy is detection and prevention. It only needs to be done every 10 years for cancer-free patients uh, versus Cologuard for every three years. Uh, so Correct. some people say Cologuard might even end up being more expensive if you have to, because because you have to do it more often. Yeah. Although there are some colonoscopies, uh, if they find a couple of polyps, you know, um, depending on what they find in the colonoscopy, sometimes it's even less than ten years too. It could be every five years, every three years as well. So okay. that's another caveat. Okay. So um, and if your doctor finds, a, and of course, the benefit of the the colonoscopy, if your doctor finds polyps during the colonoscopy, he or she can prevent it from turning into cancer by removing it. And that's obviously right. something with Cologuard that they can't do, uh, and they can't detect early right. polyps uh, forty two percent of the time. Right. So according to Exact, they're coming up with uh, Cologuard two point which hasn't come out yet because it hasn't been FDA approved. And they're stating that it's going to decrease false positives by 30%. And it's not only going to be stool tested, it's also, it's also potentially uh, blood tested. Uh, and they're stating that they may have a potential 10,000 more patients that might start using it if they get that. And this is from the company oh. itself, not from uh, okay. other studies. Right. So one of the things that they've expanded to, and one of the things I like is that they've expanded, you know, they've, they've not just depended on Cologuard, which they've been doing for like over the last 15 years. They've now, uh, they've acquired Thrive, uh, and uh, this is more blood-based and liquid biopsy. Can you talk a little bit about liquid biopsy versus a traditional biopsy? And is this something that's like uh, for the medical world, something that's exciting? Is it new technology or... Are there, pro are there issues with it? Yeah, so, I mean, liquid biopsies have been around for almost almost a decade as well, um, but they've come to the forefront mainly in the past five years or so. Um, traditionally, when we have tumors, um, we, we like to get a biopsy and have the, the biopsy specimen evaluated by a pathologist. Um, and then nowadays, we because we do precision oncology, um, we check for molecular um, mutations. Um, that's mo mostly done on tissue, but there are instances where it, where we can't get tissue, or there's places where it's hard to get um, biopsies from, um, or there's not enough tissues in, in the specimen. In those cases, liquid biopsies are 
are very important and they and they're very helpful in that situation. Um, and then those those tests from liquid biopsies give us um, molecular you know alterations, and they give us targets to go after. Um, in, in 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 some of the cases, not all, but so is liquid is is it something that can be done? Uh, does it have to be done when a patient's symptomatic, or do you see it like being done maybe early on to detect uh, or prop you know detect the uh, uh, cancer before they're actually diagnosed with it as just a part of like a routine checkup? Um, in the oncology field or even generally, I don't think that is widely used in, in um, detecting early cancers as of yet. Although, I mean, it's been in testing, it's it's um, in the trials, but nothing has been hit, you know, the um, FDA hasn't been approved that in that way. Um, the way we, we check uh, or the way we utilize liquid biopsies is once we have an established diagnosis of a cancer, to check for other any molecular alterations um, to see what else we can target afterwards. Excellent. So they've uh, uh, obtained the company Thrive, and I think they're invested in this and kind of want to grow with, with the medical world. Right. So th this is something that's new and it hasn't hit prime time yet. And, and this, is, this is actually because of them purchasing this and some other companies, uh, some other companies in the genomics field. Uh, this is right, really what caught my interest. You know, this is like a company, like I said, that's been trading for the last uh, 10, 15 years under $10, uh, started growing. And it's because of them, you know, just trying to be, have disruptive, dis disruptive technology. So um, they hope to detect cancer early. I think that's their goal um, with Thrive Technology and Liquid Biopsy. They want to detect it early and, and uh, they hope to solve cancer, you know, which is a major task, right? Solving, actually solving cancer. Uh, right. And according yeah. to uh, American Cancer Society, it's the number one killer for people under 85 years old. And it totals in 9.5 million annual deaths uh, per year, which is, which is outrageous. It's a lot. It's a big number. Um, they also say there's a $25 billion market opportunity that they hope to capture some of. So um, bringing together winning approaches to lead multi-cancer screening, uh, they've done, this is uh, on their website directly, what they've done. Uh, if you can kind of break down what you understand from, from this as far as uh, uh, finding cancer across 10 organs, 65% uh, detected cancers were early stage. This is, I guess, what they've accomplished so far after they uh, right. so, obtained Thrive. Right, so this, this is probably still in, um, in experimental stages, I think, but it's, um, I, I think it, 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 if, if it can be found through blood, like CTD, what we call CTDNA, uh, circulating DNA cells, I think that would be very beneficial in, in detecting cancers and preventing any um, widespread disease that we see nowadays. Excellent. So they've collaborated with the Mayo Clinic uh, to identify biomarkers associated with 15 of the deadliest cancer. Um, they've, uh, this is a non-invasive approach as opposed to biopsies in the past would be invasive, right? Correct. Uh, or still, I mean, still not in the past, it's still what we do now. Uh, well, it's well, still a big, well, the, yeah. which they it's hope still to a big part. Right? They, they, yeah. It's still, it's the majority of the, it's the standard practice right now. Correct. Okay. Still, still the gold standard is to do a biopsy with tissue. Okay. So, so but, but liquid biopsies are, are do supplement um, tissue biopsies. So, it, and what's kind they, of they haven't, they, haven't, they haven't replaced it um, the, um, tissue biopsies yet. So, is the fear that, uh, or not? I wouldn't say fear, but it's just uh, they don't have as much confidence in it because there's not enough like peer review or studies on it or journals or is that. That, that's one part of it. The other part is that there's also um, fear of accuracy as well. Um, tissue biopsies are still more accurate than uh, liquid biopsies are. Okay. So they've, they've gone into liquid biopsy. Uh, they've also targeted, uh, they've also um, uh, obtained uh, technology from TARDIS, which uh, extends in leadership and precision oncology. Uh, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about precision oncology, what that means, uh, and what does it mean in the oncology world? Sure. So we we kind of touched about the, we touched a base about this um, just recently, but 
Um, again, this is um, just checking molecular um, uh, aberrations that occur in patients' uh, tumors. Not all tumors are alike right now. The way we treat cancers are based off of um, where the disease is arising from. Um, but we're finding more and more that um, all all of us are like have a different, you know, how we have different fingerprints. That's how our molecular basis is a little different as well. Um, so um, by by having going into the molecular um, field um, or genomics, this gives us the opportunity to um, precisely treat patients according to their genomic aberrations. Okay. Um, yeah. Would, would any of that eventually replace chemotherapy, or is it just something that's a totally different way of treating things? Um, it's a totally, this is more of a diagnostic uh, tool. Um, treatment tools have also changed, but it also helps us find which targets need to be targeted. So there's a lot of medications that are coming out, a lot of them oral medications that target specific mutations, um, um, which, which is a little different than chemotherapy is itself. Chemotherapy is a broad based, usually um, attacking different parts of the DNA, um, causing you know death of the cell. Um, the, 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 uh, the information that we get from liquid biopsies and genomics um, is more to target specific um, um, areas in the cell cycle um, that, that can lead to death of the cancer cell. And, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Like with, if you have like, for example, an exact targeted area of what you want to, what you want to reach, what you know where the cancer right. is, would it right. change like maybe the amount of uh, chemo or different treatments or would it affect the treatment I mean, by it, having this information? It would, it, it would tell us different. For example, there's even, even in lung cancer, there, if you find out that a patient has a different type of mutation, the first line would be to start with an oral pill. Okay. Um, instead of doing chemotherapy. Um, so uh, the landscape has changed tremendously, um, especially with genomics being on board. Um, that has changed uh, the, the way we targeted um, certain enzymes, certain, um, you know, um, what we call um, tyrosine kinases and different types of parts of, uh, of a cell that, you know, um, affect the overall proliferation of cancer. I, I found one statement here uh, that I found interesting about uh, precision oncology is personalized medicine that can be described as the right medicine for the right patient at the right time. What, what can you Correct. say to that? Again, that that's not prime time yet completely. Um, again, there's a lot of patients, I mean, in, in, in just uh, in my practice um, and just experience is that we find patients that do have mutations, but um, that they're few and far between. Um, so at this time, we're still trying to find out more more genes. We're trying to still find out more targets, but uh, we we come leaps and bounds from where we were even ten years ago. Excellent. So I, I think that's accurate to a certain degree, um, but we're definitely growing in that direction. Yeah, and this is kind of I guess um, uh, like you said, it's still growing. Uh, evidence right. generation. They have over three hundred publications. Uh, right. 90 global teams um and it's something that, but you you see potential in it oh definitely yeah i mean even oncotype dx this is something that we use extensively in breast cancer um it's it's something that we use to make our decisions in order in, in which patients to give chemo not to give chemo uh, who we can safely safely be confident about them not having recurrence if we don't give chemo so this is a tool that we use um and we rely on very heavily um, and especially in, in the breast cancer field. Excellent. So this is kind of, uh, uh, these next few slides are straight from the uh, investor kind of website on Exact. These aren't my slides, they're uh, from Exact. And Exact, they wanna be a part of this whole whole chain here. They wanna do the screening, prognosis. Uh, is this kind of like pretty accurate, you know, what you see here as uh, far as Right. Again, this is something that we hope to have our um, practice at some point, but again, it's not completely there. Um, you know, the, I mean, like we're basically the oncotype is, is it's, it helps us with therapy selection, with prognosis, with recurrence rates, um, but everything else is not very widely available at this time. Um, maybe, maybe at bigger academic centers, um, you do see them, um, but in smaller community hospitals, it's not widespread yet. Okay. So it's it's not it's not the same as you know you can't correlate it with like an, a mammogram or colonoscopy which is widespread anywhere you go in the United States. Um, this is more um, specific and it's still in process. 
and and really this is um this is where we give the information and for the investor you have to kind of like decide okay do i think that they're in in five ten years that they're going to be one of the leaders in this field you know are they going to be a pick you know is their technology going to grow with the medical field because if there is then and you're right then you you know you're talking about possibly two three four hundred percent um growth on your investment right and this is right. the type I mean, of stocks that we go on. Yeah, Oncotype has already emerged as a leader in their field. Um, and and basically, it's and they have a lot of room to grow um, and a lot of potential to grow. Absolutely. So you see here some just some some facts and statistics of uh, 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 breast cancer. Uh, and again, like you discussed about Oncotype, um, this is just some of, uh, some of I guess, what it does yeah, so these, these are the two trials that basically came out um so oncotype dx basically is split pa patients into three um categories was low risk intermediate risk and high risk and this taylor uh, rx trial ta taylor x trial actually um basically um gave us information so that intermediate um part of the, what i described was not available to us um, but the Taylor X is, has given us information and told us which patients benefit from chemotherapy, which do not. Um, and this RX Bonder trial basically just came out, um, or the results came out in San Antonio Breast Conference that was held in um, December of 2020. Um, and again, this this uh, gave light to patients, even with, so uh, basically the Oncotype DX we use in patients who are, have no lymph nodes. but. In our expander, they were able to check patients who had one to three lymph nodes, and they um, kind of spread, you know, um, separated which patients would benefit from chemotherapy and which would not, even with positive lymph nodes. Excellent. Um, again, this goes back to what they're saying about the therapy selection. And what about Oncotype Map uh, is. Which so this, this this is I think again this is a test that is coming to the forefront but is not um, again prime timing yet. Um, so but this is promising. Um, uh, but again, Oncotype DX did um, one for breast has really taken off. There was one Oncotype DX that was for colon cancer that we don't use as much, um, but for various reasons. Um, but this is something that seems to be um, very um, exciting in so this field. So right now for the investor investors, like they're hearing a lot about genomics. There's over the last year, we've had quite a few like uh, stocks like BNGO and, and other stocks that gen genomics have played a major role uh, because right. they're, they're talking about some breakthrough. Can you just briefly break down what exactly is genomics and how does it play a, play a role in, in the medical field? So genomic profiling is basically, again, just um, listing or identifying which tumor mutations patients have and um, trying to see which targets uh, their cancers would be um, um, amenable to. Um, so um, basically this is this that that basically tells you how important this is to our um, our practice and how you treat patients with cancer. It gives us a lot more um, weapons as to say you know which weapons that we can use for which cancers um, ones that we didn't think of in the past. Yeah. And, and, well, it, couldn't think of the and it, it's come a long way, right? I mean, uh, Correct. I, I read somewhere that uh, a long time ago, uh, this type of testing was, was super expensive, hundreds of thousands. Um, and, Correct. And it's, it's recently Correct. gotten Correct. cheaper, right? Correct. But that, and that's because of the mapping of the genome that they were, I mean, first, many years ago, it, it took it took years and years to get that done. But now it's it's amazing how fast it's done. It's done in a matter of hours now. And, and is, is, this, is this is this similar to like when they do like uh, DNA testing, like the twenty three and Me or that that kind of stuff, where they send correct, your, yeah, correct, it's, it's, it's analogous to that, correct. Okay. So again, this is where they want to be, and you've you've already touched on it and said that they're, right. we're not there yet, but this is kind of right. they want to be a part of every stage, basically, this company. Because right. and that and that would help us, especially um help us not give patients who do not need chemotherapy um, and prevent toxicities because obviously chemotherapy is not the easiest to tolerate. Yeah. So that, that would be beneficial for us as well. Absolutely. And, and they, they talk about the, the market opportunity uh, in, in these types of tests. So we have already, we talked about um, precision oncology a bit already. 
And um, can you speak on uh, CLIA certification and SAP accreditation and all that? Labs for yeah, lab so, testing? So CLIA and, and CAP are basically more, um, these are the gold standards for pathological cert or uh, certification um, in the lab. Um, and whenever you see these, um, these are certified or approved, then you know, um, you, then you can gauge the legitimacy of the, of the company by, by these certifications. And, and, and this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm pretty bullish uh, with this company uh, because of the acquisitions they're trying to make. Uh, you see on the yeah. bottom, it says the acquisition related to this company is re uh, waiting for approval. Uh, but they, you see how they're, they're constantly investing in themselves and, and they're really making great decisions right. with their investments. And this is just kind of like a breakdown of what they've, uh, uh, their, some of their acquisitions, uh, yeah. all, all, all relevant to, to what, you know, cancer, right? And, and pretty, uh, pretty much putting themselves in a good position to, to grow as technology right. grows, right? Correct. Correct. There's, there's, like I said, there's a lot of room for growth, and um, I think these companies um, are are positioned to make that growth and um, to make some impact on on lives, really. Yeah, and so so this is kind of like how each one of those com companies would play a role in in each uh, each one of these stages. Uh, we know the Colaguard right. and Thrive and Base. This is all part of the screening process, um, and you said this is the the blood work and this gold standard for that. Uh, so they they're just trying to trying to have their footprint in the uh, in the cancer world. Uh, so what the CEO uh, has over twelve years experience, uh, making eighteen million dollars, which is a little bit more a average than the average CEO for for the company's uh, uh, market cap, which is at about two point two billion right now. Uh, but as I, as I, as I went through the team, uh, a lot of their team has a lot of experience. Uh, they spend a lot of money on advertising, uh, and growth and acquisitions. Uh, and some of the bigger, bigger investment groups also are investing heavily on this company. Uh, we got BlackRock, we got ARK Investments, which is pretty yeah. popular for investors right now. Everybody knows, uh, uh, Kathy. Would, Kathy uh, Wood. Yeah, yeah, and she's always trying to invest in disruptive technology. Uh, right. So we have the Vanguard, Capital Research, uh, J.P. Morgan, Wellington, big big names, big money uh, are taking big positions. You know, so the, these companies, sixteen over sixteen million shares, fourteen million shares. This is a two billion dollar position in the stock. So I mean, to to take that big of a position, you have you have some faith in the company. Yeah. Uh, and this is just kind of just briefly, um, I, I might make another video about their financials, but just kind of want to briefly just show how from 2011, uh, how they've continued to grow, grow, grow uh, uh, in, in, they haven't had no years, uh, pretty much except for 2014, but every other year they've been growing in revenue uh, and they're spending more, they're spending a lot more, but they're investing in themselves. This company does have a lot of cash on hand and they really have enough runway where they can function for a few years, even if business went, uh, uh, didn't go as planned. Yeah, they, they have a lot of cash on hand. Uh, mm -hmm. So that means that tells me that they're well managed, they're investing in themselves. Um, and you know, it's all, all great signs for an investor. Yeah. Some of the competition, some of the companies that are in similar field uh, or, or in the healthcare, uh, you, you see they're, they're pretty much up there as far as market cap and, uh, and growth and percentage growth. Uh, some of them do, some companies here do different things like uh, Dexacom, for example. Uh, they do uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, and we're actually going to make a video on Dexacom uh, versus Sensionic. Uh, both of them do continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, really like just, um, for technology wise, I guess for, for the diabetic that constantly has to prick themselves, this is really something great, right? You know, you just kind of, it's like, a godsend. Yeah. yeah. It's a godsend in patients. Yeah. I mean, there's some patients, um, not there because you can have fluctuations in glucose, 
um, between you know glucose checks. Yeah. Um, and and this really helps in those patients. You know, um, whether yeah. whether it's too high. I mean, obviously, if the sugar goes too high or too low, they can be both detrimental to patients' health. Yeah, Dexacom is a great company for that. I don't know if you're if you heard of Dexacom before. No, Dexacom is is one of the forefronts. Yeah. Yeah, they're very... they're up there. So they've actually partnered up. So that they do the continuous monitoring, but the uh, actual insulin is is administered according to the monitoring. So the patient right. doesn't even have to do the, the the insulin; it does it automatically. And they've yeah. year there's after there's two year. portions to that. There's a there's a continuous glucose monitor, mm -hmm. and there's an insulin pump. Um, so it's it's a it's a different you know set, but uh, it's um, it, it works very well. Yeah. So Dexacom has has grown so much. Anybody who was invested in this early. Is, is has made a lot of money. So I was going to make a video with uh, them uh, versus Synthionic, which is another company. It's cheap right now, and they're popular in Europe, and they're trying to uh, get some FDA approval uh, here in the United States. Um, and that'll be the next video. We'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, and just to show um, how much XS has grown compared to the healthcare system, compared to the uh, S&P, uh, you've seen if, if you would have invested, you know, how much your, your investment would have grown. And this is even with the uh, recent dip, you know, it's dipped down a little bit. Uh, but you've, uh, you've, over the past year, you would have made 37, over 37% 37 in your, uh, um, in your return. Portfolio. Yeah, you know, which is excellent. You know, you invest uh, 100,000, you've, you've made an extra 37,000 this year. And there's still a lot yeah. more room for growth. Yeah. So my thesis on this, um, I didn't do a DS DCF uh, just because they've had like negative EBITDA, uh, but this company uh, with their genomics acquisition and their two-pronged approach to cancer screening and non-invasive Cologuard, uh, they continue, they, they've, con they've continued to gain uh, uh, popularity, especially with their liquid biopsy. Uh, they have a lot of room gro for growth, uh, potential of being a part of the disruptive uh, uh, technology that we talk about. They have some potential catalysts coming out with some FDA approvals for their 2.0 version of the Cologuard. Um, these, in my opinion, aren't like going to be major breakthroughs. Uh, their Cologuard 2.0. Uh, what the Cologuard 2.0 would do was try to eliminate some of those false positives, which is right. pretty important. I mean. Cologuard is still a very good um, product. I mean, especially yeah. in patients who, I mean, who are dead against, you know, getting a colonoscopy. I think that's, it's a very, um, it fits that niche, you know, um, where patients who don't want to go, who don't want to go through the prep. So I think the Cologuard ha has its role as well. So, Absolutely. So, and if, and if you can, and if you can decrease the false positivity, I think that's going to be a big plus. So that, that, that's really important. Their Cologuard would, Keep this company from me, in my opinion, uh, at least as a decent investment. So if they just had Cologuard and you invested it, um, I think you would yeah. still see some returns. Uh, but we want the major returns. And I think that's where them purchasing Thrive, them getting into genomics and all that, that's where I see the potential upside. Uh, some of the yeah. risks are the competitive risk, right? We have Illumina uh, that's been a part of Precision Oncology and is quite ahead of uh, uh, exact already um is that something you guys heard of uh, before illumina i have not heard of illumina but exact I, is a little bit more than what we use their products is what we use mm -hmm. i'm not sure maybe i've probably heard of the products they have but i'm not I'm so sure okay and um so cologuard uh, accounts right now it accounts for 60 percent of their revenue so that's why I'm, I'm hoping that their other ventures uh, in the next few years would, would start getting some more FDA approvals, would start getting a little bit more, uh, uh, maybe some peer reviews, uh, just positive feedback. And that's going to help this company grow. Uh, my recommendation for this company is a buy. I'm not saying a strong buy right now just because of the macro. I don't know how much more the uh, market is going to correct. Um, but... I think even right now, at, um, uh, because of, and my price target is 195 for this, and that's based off of 25% of compound annual uh, growth. Uh, they, I showed a chart before that over the f last five years, they've been growing. I think they're going to continue to grow in revenue. Uh, and based off of that, within the next few years, where their market cap is going to be, 
Um, I am I am uh, uh, setting a target for 195. They're trading at 122 right now, so there's a 62 percent upside. Um, let's see here. So going back to Exas, uh, let's quickly look at the chart. Um, if you're an investor and you truly believe in a stock, uh, technical analysis isn't really important to you. You know, you just you just buy and and you you feel like it's going to grow, then that's fine. Um, I, I, I like technical analysis, be, I guess, just maybe because of my foundation is in day trading and day trading is all about technical analysis. So I just like to make sure I'm getting the best uh, best entry. If you look at this stock uh, in September, it was trading at low 70s, October's low 70s, and then it just had a major growth. Uh, and you see it here bouncing off the 50 average, uh, hitting a top here, 50 support and resistance. And this is pretty much this downtrend right here. This is the correction that we've had last week. This is a lot of stocks. It doesn't mean that the stock is bad. Uh, it maybe was overvalued, um, but the reason, you know, uh, not to get too deep into the correction, it's just uh, uh, some people are starting to fear inflation uh, with the bonds and yields increasing. So a lot of big investors are taking profit. And that's what this is, a lot of people taking profit. Um, you see here, this is the 200 moving average and really exact kind of bounced almost perfectly on the 200 moving average uh, from 110 to 120. I, I still am bullish. Um, I think even if it continued to drop a little bit, um, I would you know uh, buy some at this position. If it dropped a little bit more in the 200, I would buy add a little bit more. Uh, but I'm, I'm bullish in this stock. Um, I like that the RSI is below 40. So uh, you see here, anytime that the RSI was below 40, you know, it had like an uptrend. And I think that over the next few years, as they get, uh, as the company grows and is used more and its genomics becomes more widely known uh, or more widely used and accessible to, to all types of hospitals, I think this company is just going to grow with the technology. Yeah, um, I mean, that's for sure. Genomics is, a, is an uptrend for sure. Absolutely. Um, and, so this, this is a great investment um, and I like to do my research and then like to see what the experts say. So I did my research and then I went on tip ranks just to see what the analysts say. And they're all, a lot of them, you know, with uh, these, some of these guys are just like the best in the world, uh, in the country, as a matter of fact, I'm sorry, for as, as far as analysts and ratings. And, you know, these guys, they have a price target of 180, 185, uh, 163, 180. Uh, 226. Uh, so you see here the range is between 140 and 226. I gave it a price target of 195 before I looked at this, um, but I'm I'm really bullish on this stock. So that's that pretty much end this video. Doctor Smell, would you like to add anything or have have any uh, last minute advice for us? No, I think this is a like you were saying. This is a very good stock. Genomics has. Uh, a lot of potential um, and it's only going to grow. So I think um, I, I agree with being bullish on this stock as well. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So so again, so I am personally not invested in it yet. I uh, just want to make that clear. I'm not invested. If I did have a position, I would say um, I haven't taken a position just because of the market correction, but I do uh, plan on taking a position next week. If I do, I will post a video about it. Um, mm -hmm. Again, this is not uh, investor advice. I'm not an investor. I'm uh, just going over the education. Please do your own due diligence. And this is not medical advice. None of this is to be taken as medical advice. Uh, this is just purely for educational purposes. And we'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Ismail, for coming and really just breaking down and be able to explain some of that terminology and just breaking it down in a way so that we can understand it. And thanks again for joining us on our first yeah. show here with Prosperity Trade. I really appreciate having you, Dr. Ismail. Right. Thank you, Mr. Valdez. Appreciate it. Thank you okay. for having me. Thank you. Thank you for watching our video to the end. My name is Juan, lead trader and founder of Prosperity Trade. If you liked the video, please hit the subscribe, hit the like. We plan on providing more videos just like this. On this specific video, this was DD on XS, which we're bullish on. We brought in an oncologist, did our due diligence, and that's the reason we're bullish. And we plan on doing this on more stocks, on penny stocks, on mid cap stocks, on micro cap, large cap. Uh, we plan on talking about day trading, 
what setups do we like? We are not full-time day traders, but occasionally we do take a day trade or two on setups that we have done extensive research on and feel comfortable. We wait for the trade to come to us. Same thing for swing traders. We do our swing trade due diligence. We make sure that we're coming in at the right spot. We have our proper technical analysis. Um, if we're trading a more riskier stock, we might hedge our position and take a less risk stock by using options and selling calls or selling puts. So pretty much any aspect of investing, of trading, this website, this web page, this YouTube channel, everything that we offer on behalf of Prosperity Trade is going to be surrounded around that. So once again, uh, thanks for watching to the end. Please hit the subscribe, please hit the like. Thank you for joining us.